were marching in memory of those that had marched before them 200 years ago. Back then it was an act of desperation, born out of hunger, repression and disillusionment. I came across it because I lived locally um, in Lower Hartsey on the route of the march and I came across a plaque and it was just fascinating to find that this had taken place and I didn't know anything about it. And lots of the people, even people living in this area, do not know a lot about the Pentridge Revolution. And they don't know where Pentridge is, they will have heard of the Peterloo Massacre, they may have heard of um, the Tolpuddle Martyrs and other groups, but they know nothing about Pentridge. So our aim is to claim our place in history and bring it back into the popular memory, if you like, in schools and in the community. It is incredibly important to commemorate because it's part of our history and at that time there was so much unrest going on and it was you know, people um, starting to fight for, for their democratic rights but also about how they were being treated as industries changed and moved and it's just so important to remember the struggles that people have fought before us to get the things that we're able to benefit from today so for me that's very, very important. Most of the politicians who are in office during the period of the Pentridge Rebellion uh, are contemporaries. They've gone through that French Revolution. Some of them actually witnessed events in Paris. So the authorities are obsessed with the idea that normal people would come out and actually start a revolution themselves. I think for the rebels themselves, uh, certainly the ideas of the revolution are still extremely strong, particularly Thomas Paine, who wrote The Rights of Man, uh, and Thomas Bacon, who's the local Pentridge radical, who goes right back to the time of the French Revolution. He'd been campaigning to make those ideas a reality for the best part of his adult life. So the revolution is two sides of the same coin uh, in terms of those who are supporting those ideas and authority who's actively resisting them. The fact it was the last revolution in England um, and I think the, the gist of trying to raise its profile to something that people recognise, like, for instance, everybody's heard of the Tollpaddle Martyrs and the Luddites and things like that, and it's really just as important as that. So that's why we're trying to, to raise the profile of it. The notion of actually getting involved with something like that makes you become aware of the social makeup, the social disintegration, the social changes going on in the country at the time. Walkers peacefully commemorate the 200th anniversary of the Pentridge March, where as many as 400 men took up arms in order to create a more fair system for all. However, there was a traitor in their midst. Well, William Oliver was a government spy, and um, he joined the uh, not just the Pentridge Revolution, but um, lots of groups around the country mm. in the north. He went round them all. Um, basically uh, fermenting um, rebellion. Um, he promised them that uh, 40,000 people would turn out in London if they went to London. And that's what uh, really got the uh, revolution going, really. So he instigated it? Well, that's what people think. He, he was a, a agent provocateur, really, but as you call him now, these days, uh, possibly. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, certainly he was a government spy and he, he, he um, gave information back to the government on all the meetings, uh, which is, is quite well recorded in, in government documents. I think he'd had a fairly chequered past up to that point, and he'd obviously, uh, you know, he, he sort of put himself at the service of the, um, of the government, and I'm sure he, he made a fair degree of money out of it as well. He did end up uh, going to South Africa, um, where he died not many years later after the revolt. Um, but yeah, I think he was a, he sounds a very, um, I don't know, kind of unpleasant kind of character, somebody who was really manipulating uh, the people around him to, you know, to go beyond what they would have otherwise perhaps done. I think you know, he, was, he was an instrumental figure in, in the uprising, um, but in a way that you know, the government of the day should have been ashamed of, really. Many of their aims were to bring about the rights to men in particular, um, and uh, the population in general that we now take for granted. At that time you could be put into prison without trial under the suspension of habeas corpus. You weren't allowed to meet in groups of more than 50. 
the press was heavily censored. The reporting on the trial was absolutely restricted until the trial was over. Now, you know, those kinds of things only happen in countries these days where people don't have human rights, and yet it was happening in our country 200 years ago. As the group marched through the night, their numbers grew. They stopped at houses along the way to collect arms and men. They came here and went to Mrs Hepworth's house. They banged on the door and found that it was firmly closed. A warning shot was fired through the door and the servant was killed. This caused a black mark in the marcher's name. The Pentrit Revolution was a link in the chain uh, between uh, aspects like Luddism, which were to do with employment and uh, the rights of workers, and in contrast, the movement towards political reform, which was not only the preserve of the middle classes, but working men who were literate, like Thomas Bacon, could certainly contribute to that through the local secret committees and the Hamden clubs, and they were very much involved in wanting to create a better society. Nottingham, for example, was a very divided uh, town at the time. You had the Duke of Newcastle and um, Nottingham Castle on one side of Nottingham, and you had the absolute slums of Nottingham on the other side of Nottingham, and the contrast between the two areas could not be more stark. And you can see that in you know, the growing industrial cities and towns right across North and Midlands. Um, and the Regency government were completely out of touch with the needs of ordinary people. Uh, the famous uh, saying, of course, is Cornwall had um, 46 MPs, Leeds and Manchester had none. I think it's really right to remember Pentridge, and I think what is so heartening is that it's at the heart of the community today. So 50 years ago, there was a lot of commemoration about the 150th anniversary, and it tended to be, you know, academic historians coming and telling people about its significance. What's great about today in this period is so much of the commemoration is community driven. So that's really important, I think. I think there's something about Pentridge that is appealing to us today. And it may be because of current political climate or social and economic issues, but in a way I also think it's about the fact that these are men who believe that by their own actions they're going to affect the change that they want to see in the world. And I think there's something very powerful about that. So although it failed, although in a way it was doomed to failure, I think there's something about that aspect that is, is almost uh, eternal. It's certainly very contemporary. So I think it's, it's absolutely right that we do that, whilst at the same time acknowledging that it came at a price. It came at the price of men's lives, it came at the price of those who resisted en route that were threatened with violence. So it's not that we're celebrating, in a sense, the failed revolution, but we are thinking about what it is that makes people feel that they have no other outlet than to rebel. Here we are in Giltbrook, and this is where we reach our journey's end. It was here that the marchers were apprehended by two local magistrates and a group of armed men. Three of the rebel leaders were sentenced to death by hanging, and then they were beheaded. Several others were transported to Australia. The whole event was immortalised by Percy Shelley, who referred to it as the death of British liberty. Raise your